I'm Lavana Lewis, and I'm the Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Saul Price School of Public Policy. And it is in that role that I welcome you to today's session, Art as Policy, Autism, Education, Research, and Music, Inclusion for Neurodiversity, a Conversation with Efenanya Wike. She's the founder and executive director of an innovative 501c3 nonprofit organization called Jazz Hands for Autism. Uh, Enrique is a, a USC alum who received a master's uh, in nonprofit leadership and management from the USC Saul Price School of Public Policy and is currently working on her doctorate in educational leadership at the USC Rossier School of Education. She was recently honored as one of 40 emerging civic leaders in uh, uh, Los Angeles County. Uh, Ifu uh, is a, an e ABA trained um, behavior interventionist, helping adults on the autism spectrum turn their musical talents into a career in the music industry and to shift the perception of autism uh, in the general public. And so please join me in welcoming Efu. Please uh, show, show yourself to the audience and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Lavana. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor, actually. I'm very happy to be here. So thank you for this opportunity. Well, I wanted to just uh, to start with, with some fundamentals, uh, recognizing that we have a, a diverse audience who uh, may have some clinical understanding or not have a clinical understanding. But can we just start with a, a basic definition of autism spectrum disorders and also talk a little bit about the services uh, that are available to people across the lifespan with the autism diagnosis? Um, okay, so autism um, is a developmental disorder that primarily affects an individual's social and communicative communicative abilities, um, but I'm no clinician, um, but from the individuals that I've met and that I've interacted with and I have befriended, I don't, I personally don't see autism as a disorder. Um, I do see it as a divergence from what may be common, um, a divergence, but not a disorder. So um, like, for example, I've, I've heard of, read about and met some individuals on the autism spectrum who can, who can sing, but may not be able to speak and they can sing very beautifully. So that's the reason why I can, I personally consider it a, a divergence and a disorder, but, um, Clinically, it is uh, defined as a developmental disorder. And, uh, in, and in regards to services, I mean, there are, there's a heavy focus on early, like early intervention. So there are a lot of services for children. Um, but the thing is that after, a, typically after a person with autism leaves high school, um, there are not many services for adults who have autism, especially services that help them live a meaningful life. So there's definitely like a, a, like a, a cliff end to services that are available uh, to adults with autism. And that's the reason why uh, Jazz Hands for Autism specifically focuses on adults with autism. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, and I noticed that uh, under your uh, logo for your organization, you say, make your passion your vocation. And you, <laughs> and you have certainly done that. And so can you talk a little bit about uh, kind of your inspiration for uh, Jazz Hands for Autism? You talk about the fact that services for uh, adults may be lacking. And again, you come in to address that gap. Um, so the history of Jazz Hands uh, is very interesting. It's very organic. Um, there's some people who plan to start a nonprofit and they, you know, they take all the, all the different steps. I did not plan to do that. I, I kind of was ushered into it. I, I kind of stumbled, stumbled across it. Um, I, the way that Jazz Hands came to be was um, as a behavior interventionist, part of my role was to shadow other behavior interventionists to kind of understand more of what they were doing. And in that process of shadowing um, a behavior interventionist, I met a really, really talented individual who has autism. Um, and that day he happened to have music class. Um, and so typically during the day he was, um, essentially separate from his, his classmates. So, you know, he was in the classroom, but he was separate from his classmates and he spent a lot of the, his time managing his behaviors. Um, however, when we, when we got to music class, um, he immediately gets on the piano and starts singing. And then something amazing happened. You know, somebody gets on the piano, somebody gets on the drum. I mean, some, somebody gets on the guitar, somebody gets on the drums and they are accompanying him in, in song. Um, and so what I saw that day was when a person with autism or just when anybody really are in, in their element in a, in a place where they feel strong, 
um, they can one, be able to communicate with other people and two, be able to build community around themselves. And that's that's how Jazz Hands came to be. Um, we began first just as a concert platform for adults, uh, for people with autism who are interested in music. And then from there, we've grown and evolved to also provide services that help them develop other skills. So professional skills and um, deepen their musical skills and also social skills so that they can be able to go out into the world and be a part of their communities as well. Uh, thank you. I uh, appreciate that answer and in terms of the genesis of your organization. But I also want to go a little further upstream and talk about this, this issue as it relates to uh, public policy. Mm -hmm. uh, you came to us uh, as a, um, uh, for our uh, master's in, in, long, in, in, in leadership, but you really focused in on policy and you see the, the nexus of music or the arts and policy in a very clear way. Can you talk a little bit about that with the audience? Um, so I'm just going to start first just with the disability rights movement um, there. I mean, th there's been several instances, but, it, you know, it, it really um, during the civil rights movement of the 1960s, the disability rights movement was also um, very um, was very prominent. And one of the one of the slogans um, during the disability rights movement was nothing without nothing about us without us. Right. Um, and so the, re the reason why I bring that up is because uh, for many people who may have disabilities, or especially like uh, um, uh, conditions like autism, there, there may not be traditionally ways for them to be a part of the movement. Um, and what music does, what, what music allows uh, individuals with, with autism to do is be, to be able to be a part of that movement. As I mentioned earlier, um, the individual that I met, he spent most of his time in his, in his typical you know, core classroom managing his behaviors, quote unquote. But when he got to, into music class, that was a way that he was able to, like I said, not just communicate with people, but also build community. And so music and arts have, in, in many different movements, if you look across history, music and arts have been a way to, to, to build movements that eventually change policy. And so, that, so th that's the reason why, one, this, this, uh, this talk is titled Arts as Public Policy. And two, why, why I'm, I'm so passionate about music a, as a tool to be able to help individuals who have dis, you know, autism and other disabilities to be able to integrate into their communities and, and, be, and have a voice in the movement that, 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 that then changes policy. Uh, excellent, excellent. I appreciate that. So uh, can you talk a little bit more about um, yourself as a musician? And so this isn't, a, this isn't kind of an accidental marriage, if you will. Uh, part of your passion is uh, your own training as a musician. And can you share that with us? Um, yeah, so um, just I want to just give everybody who's watching just a, a bit of a disclaimer. I cry a lot because I'm very emotional um, and that does tie a lot into my music as well. So if you see me tearing up, do not be alarmed. That's just part of the way that I express myself and communicate. Um, but um, music for me is, I mean, it is everything. Uh, it's the way it's the as you can see, I stutter sometimes um, and music is is literally the clearest way that I can communicate with people what's on my heart, what's in my mind, what I, my experiences have you know, brought, brought to me. Oh, there it goes, there it goes, okay. <laughs> um, and so music, like, so I'm, I'm a vocalist. So as a musician, I'm a vocalist, I'm a singer songwriter. I'm also, I also just started playing bass. Um, and like I said, music for me is everything. So I, if you listen to my music, if you listen to music that I write, you, can, you literally can hear more of who I am than I can ever express in just in just speech or in writing. Um, so that's the reason why. So music is is my ultimate passion. So I understand firsthand how music can be, can be a means and a tool for communication. And then the way that, that I um, was introduced into the autism community was after I, I um I volunteered at a program. I, I went to UCLA, so sorry, sorry to all my Trojan family. Uh, for undergrad, I, I was at UCLA. Um, and after my, my sophomore year, I volunteered at a program uh, that worked with kids who had autism. And once I volunteered there, I just felt so, I just, that's just, I felt like this is what I want to do. This is where I, where I want to be. This, this is the population that I want to work with. Um, because I just, I felt very, I just, related very well with, with, uh, with the individuals that I work with. Um, and then after following that, um, I tried to combine music and, uh, and autism um, by becoming a voice, a voice coach to, to young kids who had autism um, and, and also a piano teacher. Um, and then from there, you know, things led to one thing led to another. I became a, 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 um, a behavior interventionist. And then, like I said, I met this, this young man who essentially was the inspiration behind Jazz Hands. And he's still part of Jazz Hands to this day. So. It's great. I saw him on Saturday. 
I, I like the fact that the, the that you keep the connections because again, I think that I think that's important. And you said that the, you talked about music is the way to kind of talk about um, uh, communicates better than anything else what's in your heart and in your mind. And can you kind of think about that from a um, from a policy perspective? If you could think about policy for uh, people with autism, what kinds of things again? Uh, are in your heart and mind in terms of making a difference? So I'm very, very, um, okay. So I'll start with this. In my experience uh, working, because as a behavior intervention, I, be, interventionist, I worked in several schools. Um, I worked in the classroom with people who had autism. And one thing that I, I, I noticed num, you know, time after time was that there's very, very limited access to music education for, for, for people with autism. Um, and I find that to be problematic um, because if music is a way that one helps helps build uh, communication, you know, build bridges of communication, and also two, music has been shown to help build self-efficacy and and build um, competence in other skills, including academic skills. And then, if if people with disabilities don't have access to music education that can help them, um, you know, kind of you know build these, these different skills that would, that would then allow them to succeed, and you know. In, in, in academic subjects, then I, I believe that, that there's a barrier being created for people with disabilities. Um, be, with, w- without music education, there's a huge barrier being created and, and being perpetuated a- along the lifespan of, of people with disabilities. So um, that's that's where I, I, that's like the nexus of where I see policy and, and music specifically coming together is in up, you know, kind of upheaving our existing, you know, educational policy to make sure that, you know, it's mandated that, that people with disabilities have access to music education and, you know, like I said, mandated, not, not just an option or not, not, not just an extracurricular activity, but make that be a part of the core curriculum, um, you know, for people, for people with disabilities. So that's definitely one way that I see uh, mu- policy and art coming together to benefit the, the autism community. Okay. Uh, okay. So I want to piggyback on that a little bit because um, one of the things that I get, that I'm that I'm hearing is that this idea of um, um, the movement and getting people mobilized to uh, kind of uh, act in this space. And so um, you know, I you are a, um, a black woman, an entrepreneur. Uh, I just want to kind of get a sense of kind of how you've navigated some of these. Uh, uh, these kind of intersectional issues in terms of bringing in diverse voices uh, that, again, uh, people may not be used to hearing. And so, again, how did you, again, uh, um, create energy around what you're doing and, again, the, the support that you need for what you're doing? Um, so I'm a very passionate person. Um, and I'm, I'm the kind of person that, you know, once I'm passionate about something, that's it. Like, I'm going all in. I'm putting everything that I have into that thing. Um, so I would definitely say that I'm ch- I'm, I'm I'm a huge champion for neurodiversity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know I see autism as a di- as a divergence from the commonly trajectory you know the, the common trajectory of development or neurological processing. But like I said, I don't see it as a deficit, um, and I find it very fascinating. You know, in my in my studies at at Ross here, I, I'm, I'm working on my doctorate. Like like you mentioned earlier, I've been learning a lot about uh, something called epistemological. Hegemony, it's a mouthful. Um, and I've also been learning to challenge and question that. Um, and what I mean by that is that there are prescribed ways of knowing and being that we've all co- you know, collectively come to accept as normal or good, right? Uh, but my question is that who determined this normal? Um, and I believe that this is part of the premise of intersectionality, that there are different facets of a person or a group's identity that shape both the ways that they show up in the world and also perceive the world. Um, and those ways of being and knowing are very, very valid for these groups. Um, so essentially the way that I'm championing neurodiversity um, is that I'm hopefully challenging and disrupting the deficit narratives that surround neurodiversity. You know, so I, you know, I think that, you know, autism, you know, some people may, may, may think of autism and, and, you know, and other quote unquote learning disabilities and see them as a deficit instead of seeing them as a divergence that, that should be explored and met with curiosity. How do you see the world? You know, t- t- tell me how you see the world and show, like, you know, I want to stand from your perspective and see it so that I can, I can better know how to support you in achieving the goals and desires and dreams that you have for yourself. Um, and, and specifically, at Jazz Hands, we're doing that through music, which as we've already discussed here, is a very, very powerful and dynamic force that gives voices to stories and emotions. For people who have disabilities and people who don't have disabilities, music is the great equalizer. Everyone 
understands music. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the way that I'm essentially, uh, uh, you know, using intersectionality as a way to champion for neurodiversity because I believe that disability is a marker of identity. Um, and that's something that, that, you know, that isn't often thought about, you know, like in many different movements, you know, many different civil rights movements or, you know, you know, what, 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 whether it's the LGBTQ or the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, there, there, there tends to be um, a very, very low volume when it comes to people with disabilities who are at that intersection. And I think it's important that we begin to begin to think about that. You know, if, 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 we're, fight, if we're fighting for, you know, for, for Black Lives Matter, also Black people with disabilities matter, Black people with autism matter. If, if, if we're fighting for LGBTQ rights, there are people with, with disabilities, with autism that, that, that have gender expressions that deviate from, um, you know, the, the, the um, you know, uh, what, what, how do the, what's the, what's the term? Um, hetero, he, he, like, you know, from, from, from the heteronormative uh, definitions of gender and sexuality. Um, so I think it's important that, that, that at, at every single intersection of every single movement that we consider that there's somebody with, with a disability who identifies as, as a disabled person also with other, other identity markers. So we have to also, you know, make sure that we include neurodiversity into um, any movement that we are, um, that we are, that we are championing or advocating for. I love it. I love it. So um, give, give me, uh, help, help me to understand uh, when someone shows up with your organization, lead me through how you connect with them and kind of how they, um, how you kind of help them launch or kind of uh, get deeper into their kind of uh, the value of music and kind of the musical expression for again, the folks that are, are kind of um, connecting to your organization and the people that you work with? Um, okay, great question. So Jazz Hands for Autism, we do a lot of stuff. Um, and so I meet with our team weekly. We try, we try to figure out how best to be packaged in a way that people can understand because a lot goes on at Jazz Hands. Um, and unless you're uh, like, if you're in it, you understand the, you know, the, the movements of all the different parts of the ecosystem. But when you're outside, it may just seem as if we only do one thing or two things. So in totality, Jazz has essentially is a, an artist development, artist promotion and artist placement um, uh, organization. So musicians come to us, individuals who have autism come to us um, and they have a desire to explore music, whether, whether, you know, wh whether they're, they're just learning an instrument or whether they already have very, very deep roots in their instrument and they, they, they need somebody to help them promote themselves you know, in the industry. So, so first, the, the, the first interface we have with every individual is, okay, where are you okay, on, on, um, on, on, in your musical journey? Are you, are you just beginning your musical journey? Are you farther along and just need, need assistance? And then based on that, we then help you find support um, within the organization. We offer several different classes. I mean, we have last, I, I was talking with our curriculum um, team last week, and I think we have up to seven, 72 courses. And a lot of people don't know this because, you know, we, like I said, we're trying to find the best way to package that. Um, so based on our courses, we have work readiness training. We have, you know, all kinds of music training from, you know, in, instrument, you know, piano, drums, um, guitar. Um, and we also have music production. We have composition. Um, so you come to us and you tell us, what are your goals? So, you know, where, where are you as a musician? What are your goals? And then we help you find courses at Jazz Hands that, that you can take to help you strengthen those, uh, the, you know, your skills in, in different areas that help you get towards those goals. We also have career counsel counselors and career coaches that help guide you at every single step of your journey. So your so Jazz Hands provides holistic wraparound support. And so as you move along to uh, in your in your musical journey, we help connect you to opportunities. So at Jazz Hands, um, we have four different tracks. So we have um, performance track for those who are more interested in performing music. So whether you're playing guitar, you're singing, and you wanna sing on stage or in front of people, that's performance track. If you're more interested in teaching, so we have some, some of our musicians who not just wanna learn music, but they also wanna teach music to other people who have disabilities um, and pay it forward. And so we, so we have our, teach, our, our, music, our music teacher training program, so they, they then become part of that track. Um, if, if you're an, an, an individual who's more into, into composition, you're not necessarily wanting to perform, but you wanna compose music for video games, games or films or TV or advertising, then you're in the composition track. And then we try to pair you with apprenticeships or, you know, opportunities within the industry where you can also then begin to build those skills. And then lastly, we have another one called administration, where if you're more interested in, you know, audio engineering or stage production, we, we once again help you help you build those skills and maybe pair you with an opportunity um, in the community where, where you can build those skills. So we have partnerships um, with, you know, a couple of non-public non schools where our, our musicians are 
are going in and teaching other students. So they are teachers in, their, in, in the classroom. So they learn how to teach at Jazz Hands and then they go out and then teach uh, music to other students. Um, and then we ha we've had um, our, our musicians, you know, compose music for things, you know, for, you know, projects with the LA Zoo. We've had them perform for people um, like, you know, the ex-mayor Dick Riordan. Um, we've had them, you know, our, our musicians have interned at, you know, studios like Igloo Music, which is like a, a multi-Grammy award-winning um, studio. So essentially Jazz Hands, we, we, you come to us, we, 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 have a, we have a collaborative conversation. Where are you in your musical journey? We help you find classes at Jazz Hands that help support you on your musical journey. And then we connect you with different opportunities in the community once again, because Jazz Hands is all about community. We're, we're not just about, you know, kind of, you know, insulating you. We want you to be able to be a part of a community and use your gift, your musical gift and your musical talent as a way to advocate for not just for yourself uh, and your talents, but for the talents of other people who um, are coming either behind you or coming along with you. Um, uh, and so that's essentially in a nutshell, a very large nutshell, uh, what Jazz Hands does. So uh, thank you for, uh, again, uh, helping us to understand the organization or helping me to understand the organization. And you talk about the, um, the importance of uh, collaboration. Yes. Um, and can you talk about um, the, what's been the easiest part of building that collaboration? And what, what do you think has been the most difficult part of building those collaborative relationships? Um, when you say collaborative relationships, you mean within Jazz Hands or with other entities outside of Jazz Hands? So I think I'm talking about I'm think, I think I'm talking about both because both are necessary to have a healthy organization, right? And so let, let's just deal with um, for for sake of uh, simplicity, let's just talk about internally. How do you do the collaborative building? What's been what's been easy? What's been tough? Um, that's a great question. Um, okay, so my my first degree. Um, my, my undergrad is in anthropology. And the reason I mention that is because I believe that culture is a very, very important part of every single organization or just any kind of group. And an organization is a group. Um, so I, I, I've spent, I spent a lot of time studying human beings and culture and how they interact with each other, how culture is formed and how culture is then um, uh, perpetuated through human interaction. Um, and because of that, I, I, I painstakingly try to build a very, very collaborative cu culture at Jazz Hands. Um, so, you know, every time I, I interview, you know, incoming staff or incoming, um, you know, team members, I always make sure to, to let, let them know that Jazz Hands, like our organizational structure, the best way I can describe it is a bicycle wheel. Um, and essentially, we're all moving in the same direction at the same at the same speed. But we're all different spokes holding that 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 tire up and moving it forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so where where if if there's an area that that one team member is uh, weak in. And, and that, that, that area of, of weakness is an area when other team members are strong at, we encourage you, you know, have a, have a meeting, have a conversation, you know, you know especially if, if it's another instructor, because our, our musicians have several different, they, they meet with several different instructors because they have several different classes at Jazz Hands, right? So a challenge that, that a, a student may be having in your class, another instructor may have already overcome that with, you know, with, with, that, with that individual. And so coming together and meeting and say, okay, you know, what, what, what are some ways that, that, that you navigated this, this challenge um, that, 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 um, that, that this musician was having? And then they have a conversation and, and then they, they kind of collaboratively come up with an intervention um, that, that will assist the musician. We also have every 12 weeks, we, we operate on a, a modified academic calendar. And so every 12 weeks we have a staff meeting um, and at our staff meeting, we, we have something we call peer training, where our staff come together and we discuss every single student and we say, okay, um, what, 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 were, what were the areas where they were strong at? What were the areas where they had challenges at? Okay, so now how do we navigate these challenges as a team and come up with, 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 with a unified uh, approach to helping them um, uh, overcome or navigate some of their challenges? And so that's one way that, that we've been able to build that collaboration with our team. Now with our musicians, that, that's another layer of collaboration. Um, and we, we, we have that kind of organ uh, happen organically. You know, um, for example, at our concert, we have a concert coming up May 22nd. So I'll make sure to, to send everybody who's listening that link, or you can, you can find it on our website once we post it. Um, but essentially, our concerts are a really, really great opportunity for our musicians to get to know other people's talents, you know, and so they're like, oh, wow, like you, you love, you know, Stevie Wonder. Oh, my God, I love Stevie Wonder. Let's let's collaborate on a Stevie Wonder song for this next concert. And that, that, that so that's how that happens. Or, or you, you create beats. Oh, I rap. OK, let's let's find a way to work together. Or if 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 uh, if our musicians don't, you know, organically um, suggest that, you know, with each other, 
um, our, our instructors who know the, who know the different students, they say, hey, have you thought about, you know, doing a duet with this other person? I think you guys, I think both of your voices will sound really, really great together. Um, or, you know, you, like I, I, I hear, I hear your, your rap and, I, and this, I, there's another person that, that makes a beat. I think that you guys can make some really beautiful music together. Or, you know, um, you want to you learn how to DJ. Well, we have a DJ who's, who's uh, you, know, far, you know, more advanced. Maybe he can, he can come in and, and be a part of, 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 of your, your, your class time. And so we have like some of our students are actually peer mentors for other students who are kind of coming up in the same field. So like I said, there's a lot that happens at Jazz Hands, but we're, we're trying to figure out the best way to show that to, every, to, to, to people who are outside of our, um, our ecosystem. So thank you. I, I appreciate again this uh, this kind of peer peer learning that's taking place. I appreciate the fact that uh, um, there doesn't seem to be uh, the type of competition that would keep people from helping one another, right? And so, yes. Yeah. And you know, you know, you know what's interesting um, is that. Um, Oh, what's interesting is that I'm actually learning about that right now at school um, at Rossier, um, something called self-efficacy, right? And so uh, within self-efficacy, there's, uh, you know, two different ways of a person. I don't want to get, I don't want to nerd out. Oh my gosh. If my, <laughs> go if my, go for it. you know, if my instructor is watching, um, <laughs> Yale Sinatra, you'd be so proud of me right now. <laughs> um, but essentially there's a mastery orientation and a performance orientation. Um, a mastery orientation is when students essentially are trying to improve on their learning for, for learning's sake because they actually want to improve on, on, that, on that skill or that task. A performance orientation um, and to be, to be separated from music performance, those two are different. So performance is, orientation is different from music performance. I just want to make, sure, make that clear. Performance orientation is, you know, you want to, you want to do well so that you, you, you can look good in front, of, in front of your peers, right? And so uh, one thing that I, I find is that music performances and getting, and getting positive feedback um, allows you to build a mastery orientation as a learner because you want to improve. You hear yourself playing, you're like, and it, it, it gives you one immediate feedback by, 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 by playing the music and also you, the feedback that, that you get from, you know, whether it's your instructor or your peers or an audience allows you to want to make, you know, continue to build your skill in that instrument. So I think kind of naturally uh, music performance actually builds a, ma a mastery orientation as opposed to a performance orientation. And that kind of reduces some mm -hmm. of the competition um, that, 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 that may exist in other spheres. Thank you. Uh, there's actually a question in the, in the, in the chat that I wanted to ask you. Okay. Uh, it said, uh, but it's a simple question. This one, uh, how many active students are participating in your program right now? Great question. So we, we keep our cohorts small. So we have, we have, we have, um, we have keep our cohorts to 20 to 25. So right now we have, we have between 20 and 25 students actively participating at Jazz Hands. And the reason why, why we keep that cohort small is because we provide such individualized um, uh, training and, you know, support that if we had, you know, 500 students at one time, it makes it very, very difficult for us to be able to give that level and that depth of support um, to, ev to everyone um, at the same time. Thank you so much. So, so smaller intimacy again uh, can yes. give that kind of concentrated attention. Wonderful. Yes. A second question from uh, the chat of the many individuals on the spectrum experience uh, significant uh, sensory abilities and they can be very sensitive to noise or other stimuli. Uh, is this something that you've had to address with the uh, with some of the folks in order to allow them to um, enjoy music and engage in music? Has that been an issue? Um, so that's a really great question. And I think um, that's something that, that's, that's worth exploring more. Um, we work primarily with adults, right? So um, sensory sensitivity, if I'm not mistaken, and so if there's any clinicians in the, in the room, please do correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, um, can be found a lot more, uh, it's, it's a lot more prevalent with children. Um, and so, so as, as they grow and, and um, as individuals with autism grow, some, some, some of those sensitivities, uh, they, they kind of learn to, um, manage those. Um, so to answer your question, we do have some individuals who have sensitivity to certain kind of, so actually certain kind of music. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. So we have a student uh, musician. Um, I don't want to say his name. I don't want to you know, reveal any names, but we're going to call him A. Um, so musician A, right? Um, when he first, um, you know, started interacting with jazz hands, his, his only thing was jazz. Like if, if there was rock or anything outside of jazz, oh no, that just was not going to work out. Um, 
And now he accompanies other musicians that play vi like anything. It could be anything. It could be a rock song, a gospel song. It could be anything. Um, and th um, the thing is that initially um, his sensitivity, um, he has to, he has, he has to um, kind of gradually adjust to hearing other kinds of other kinds of, of, of sounds and music. Um, and so, you know, when, if, when he would get overwhelmed, he, he would, you know, kind of take, take a step outside and then come back in when, when, when he felt like he uh, was, was able to interact um, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a different way. Um, so kind of to answer your question in a more cohesive way, we haven't thus far experienced, um, we haven't thus far experienced, you know, many musicians who have, you know, sensitivity to sound in that way that prevents them from being able to participate. Um, but if, 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 when, if and when we, we do come across that, um, one thing about jazz hands is that we're always, research is very, very important. We always do research to make sure that we're always offering um, the best kind of support. And so we're gonna do a lot of research and, you know, kind of make sure that we are meeting their need and supporting their need in the way that, that um, in, in the best way possible. Thank you, thank you for that response. And so, um, so how do you, how do you, um, since you want to keep it intimate, uh, how do you figure out which students should be in a given cohort? What, what are you looking for when you put a kind of a cohort or a group of students together uh, through the program? What, what stands out in terms of doing so, that? Great question. So our cohorts, um, they're, they're essentially just the the, um, the time frame at which you apply and and you know kind of enroll. So it's, it's not a cohort in the sense of we kind of handpick who is in a cohort. It's more of okay, we have you know uh, 2021, 2020 cohort, 2021 cohort, 2022 cohort, and it's just based on um, the when when the student comes in um, and. When, when I say cohort, you know, other cohort models have, you know, different students at, the, in, you know, in the same classes and they, they kind of matriculate at the same time. At Jazz Hands, that isn't really the case. A cohort more is just, it, it's more a descriptive of uh, the time when you came into Jazz Hands, but your, the support that you, that you receive at Jazz Hands is still very, very individualized. Okay. Thank you for clearing that up. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of, you, you talked about your staff, you talked about... Um, uh, your volunteers, um, and you talked a little bit about uh, some of the experiences that uh, you've had at Rossier. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you think a, a public policy school uh, kind of with this mission and uh, kind of uh, its various degree programs could kind of intersect with what you do or kind of what do you feel that, that you need most from, a, from people that may be doing leadership or uh, administration or public policy? What stands out? Um, so I'll, I'll start by answering that question by just saying that, you know, um, on, on at Jazz Hands, one of our major values is community. So if you actually go to our website, you know, our values are the music. It's an acronym and the C in music is community. Um, um, so I make it a very, very big priority of mine to know who our neighbors are, um, what institutions or organizations are working to bridge gaps, to promote both um, access and accessibility. So we actually already have some ties with USC, um, with USC Price specifically, uh, beyond just me being an, 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 an alumna. Um, so one of our favorite volunteers, who you will see at the concert coming up in May. Um, he is a Price grad and a Price employee. Um, and then we're also currently collaborating with a, with a Price um, capstone class to find solutions to some of our, our most pressing challenges. And then lastly, we also have some, uh, on the, like on the Rossier side, we have some Ross, current Rossier students and Rossier grads on our staff that are helping us redesign our curriculum. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that we, we already have some ties because I, I, make, I make it a very, very big part of my uh, my work as the executive director to, like I said, know who our neighbors are. Um, and so, um, it, so that's essentially one way that, that, that we have been interacting with, with, with the School of Public Policy. But I think beyond that, um, you know, Price, Price School is, is, is one of the top schools of public policy. And so many, many, many of our, our forthcoming uh, political leaders are going to likely come from Price. Um, and so I think that, you know, helping students understand the impact of um, educational policy, especially as, as it impacts our most vulnerable students and our most marginalized students is very, very important. So being able to collaborate with, with you, know, you know, incoming or um, current price students uh, who are, you know, in the MPP or the MPA program, or even the, 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 the Master of Nonprofit Leadership and Management program to understand, you know, how policy influences real life experiences for people. Um, and how, you know, cutting music, music programs is not a good idea, especially because it disproportionately affects 
people who have disabilities and people who have autism. Um, so I think, you know, um, one way that, that, that we can operationalize, you know, that, that collaboration is, you know, having internship opportunities available at Jazz Hands um, where, you know, um, a public policy students can come in and learn more about the real experiences of people who have, you know, autism and disabilities um, and be able to take that back into, into, into their, their class, their classwork or even their careers moving forward and be able to th then become advocates. Um, like for example, like many of our interns, so at Jazz Hands, we have a very, very robust internship program, um, especially, you know, with the UCLA psychology department where a lot of cognitive science students come in and intern at Jazz Hands. So we have our research and evaluation internship, we have our public policy intern, we have several different internship opportunities at Jazz Hands. Um, and so we, we've, we've had many of our interns return and say, hey, you know, this, this internship at Jazz Hands made me want to go into working specifically with this population and advocating on behalf of this population. And so that is, I think, like I said, one way that uh, jazz hands and price can can collaborate. It's just making more internship opportunities available, or maybe establishing a a, a formalized internship, um, you know, uh, program between Price and UCLA. I mean, at, at Price and Jazz Hands. <laughs> And then uh, I know, right? Sorry. <laughs> um, and then lastly, we also are always seeking to expand our board of directors. So if there are any Price grads who are interested in being a part of our board, we'd love to have that conversation or Price faculty. Uh, we'd love to have that conversation about how they can be more involved, you know, in the day to day or kind of just like the uh, the nitty gritty of, you know, um, working on behalf of, you know, individuals who have, who have autism. So, so uh, five. Following up on kind of that, that line of thinking, um, so uh, very straightforward question. Uh, how are your programs supported uh, financially? Oh, that's so funny because the next thing I was going to talk about was funding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jazz Hands, we are currently, um, we're currently a, um, a vendor of the regional center. Uh, we're a vendor of, I believe, five regional centers. So there's a... Uh, um, West Side Regional Center, there is North LA, there's Frank D. Letterman, which a lot of people who are in the, in the, in the USC community are, are part of that catchment area and also South Central LA, which is also in, in the catchment area of, of, U, of USC. And then lastly, I, I were also a vendor of Harbor um, Regional Center, which is further South. Um, and so that's, that's our primary source of funding, but we, you know, we do realize, and this is something that I learned from my program at Price, um, is that you know, as a nonprofit organization, you want to make sure that you're diversifying your funding sources. And so we're trying to um, um, diversify by applying for more grants. Um, we actually recently applied for a grant that is tied with USC, so hopefully we get it. Um, and so, so yeah, funding is a challenge for every nonprofit. Um, and so our work is limited by the amount of funding that we have. So the more funding we have, the more work that, that, that we can do. Um, and so if there are any funding opportunities that are in, that tied into Price or USC in general, uh, Jazz, we would love for Jazz Hands to be considered in those, uh, in those uh, opportunities. Thank you for that. And can you talk a little bit about in terms of the, the volunteering piece? How does one become a volunteer? What are the expectations? Is there flexibility or do you have kind of a, some standard things that you want your volunteers to do for you? Um, great question. So like I said, um, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to David Horn. You're the best. David Horn is, is uh, he's, a, he's a Price grad and also an employee of Price. And he's one of our long, longtime volunteers. He's been with us for I believe three years now. Um, and he volunteers at our jam session. So every Saturday we have jam session. Um, when we were in person, of course, it was at our studio in Culver City, but we've been doing, we've been having those online via Zoom. And so he and I collaborate uh, because, you know, he's gotten to know all the musicians that attend the jam session. So we collaborate to, you know, kind of prepare for our concerts at the jam session. So that's one way that volunteers can be involved is to volunteer at the jam sessions. Um, and one thing about Jazz Hands is um, part, a big part of our culture within Jazz Hands is innovation. So we're always looking for ways to improve what we're doing. Um, so if, if, if there, there are always endless opportunities to be involved at Jazz Hands. We just have to figure out, you know, what, what, what do you want to gain, you know, as a volunteer, what do you want to gain from a volunteer opportunity? And then, then, we, then we will look at Jazz Hands and see what our needs are and see how we, how we can match your, your, your desires with Jazz Hands needs and, and kind of create a volunteer opportunity or internship opportunity for, for you. So uh, you just brought in something that uh, I said I wasn't going to talk about, but since you brought it up, I'm going to talk about it now. So uh, can you can you share a little bit how uh, COVID uh, nineteen has impacted the work and kind of um, wow what 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 you see happening um, kind of post or when we're 
got a little bit more freedom than we have right now? Um, so specifically our work at Jazz Hands, um, and I've been, aside b- beyond that, I've been, you know, I'm very kind of tied into the NAM. So that's the National Association for Music Merchants. They're like a very, very big organization and they are huge advocates for music education. Uh, so I've been plugged in with them. Um, and one thing that has been kind of the, um, the main, the, thir- the thoroughfare, the, the thread, the connecting thread uh, across many different organizations and kind of music-based organizations is moving everything online or just really every organization, every, every, everybody move everything online. So Jazz Hands, we did the same thing. Um, so once we, once we saw that, that COVID was, once we, once, once we knew that COVID was a thing, we like maybe like less than a week later, we moved everything online. We moved all our classes of our students online. We provided training for our staff and our, and our, and our musicians. And one thing that we learned is that our musicians, some of our musicians actually prefer the online format, which was very, very shocking. Actually, we, we were not expecting that. And the second thing is our musicians, you know, when it comes to autism, um, one of the, the manifestations that is often talked about is rigidity um, and resistance to change or just very, very a preference for routine. But our musicians showed immense flexibility in their ability to just adapt to an online format. Um, you know, to, you know they, 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 they got into their Zoom rooms, they, they knew what time their schedule was, they knew what, they knew what, what instructors they were gonna be meeting with. And so, we, like I said, we, we moved all of our classes online and our musicians, they showed immense flexibility and, and uh, immense um, uh, adaptability to the online format. And then on top of that, we've also been getting a lot of demand from different places um, beyond LA uh, for people who are interested in what we do because, you know, uh, music, like I said, I, maybe I didn't say it earlier, uh, music education is very limited for people with disabilities, um, and so um, when people hear about what we do, they 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 want to they want to become involved. You know, we've had people from Florida, from Massachusetts, from Texas, from Sacramento, from Bakersfield, um, you know, contact us and you know ask about what we do. So one thing that we are doing, and this is how we are involving the Rossier School of Education, is where um, we are uh, making our curriculum available for di- for. For, for students who are near or far by, you know, kind of taking advantage of the digital space. Um, so I can't speak too much on that, but that's kind of like what I can say in regards to that. And then on top of that, our musicians now, you know, social me- their social media is buzzing, you know, you, know, you know, they're doing Instagram lives and things like that. So, you know, not having as much opportunity to, to, to interact in person, our musicians moved, moved a lot of their interaction online. So, you know, like I said, with social media, Instagram live, our concerts are online now. Um, for right now until we come back in person. So at Jazz Hands, we, we responded very quickly to the digital, to the move towards digital. And so we, we followed suit. So uh, thank you. So uh, now that's a two part question. So do you think kind of going forward, you're gonna kind of keep that hybrid model? I mean, uh, being able to do both. And then second, I mean, it sounds like it worked very well for, uh, for your students. Uh, did it work equally well as it, for your um, instructors and other volunteers? So great question. Um, so I'll answer your first question. Um, yes, we are, we are intending to continue the hybrid model. Like I said, some of our musicians actually prefer the online, the online uh, format. So we wanna give them an a, a option and you know, to be able to choose you know, how they are able to engage with their, with their, music, their musical journey. Um, and then for our staff, I actually was sitting in on one of our curriculum roundtables, development roundtables last week. Um, and one of the questions that was asked by one of our staff is, you know, you know, what are the, what were the challenges, what, 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 how has your experience online teaching online been? And most of, and all, all, essentially all of our staff that was there said that, you know, it's actually helped them be a lot, you know, kind of just break things down more, you know, like, you know, kind of slow things down a little bit more in, instead of, you know, like maybe in person, some things could have, you know, kind of been steamrolled over being online actually helped our instructors, you know, kind of pace themselves and, and you know, help our, our kind of be more attentive to what's going on with, um, to, with each musician um, and then be able to meet that up more immediately. So it's actually benefited not just our musicians, but also our staff as well. But of course, there's always, um, you know, individuals, we have some individuals who don't like the, don't like the online format because, you know, for different reasons, like, you know, connectivity issues. Um, and that's something that I actually want to talk about really quickly is that, um, I'm very, as, as a black, you asked about intersectionality earlier, as a black woman, I'm very, very passionate um, about, about individuals of color who have disabilities as well, because there, there, is, there is significant inequities in access to resources. Um, some, of our, some of our musicians who are students of, uh, musicians of color and people of color who have autism um, don't necessarily have as, as much um, access to, you know, consistent Wi-Fi. 
Um, and so we're very, very sensitive to that. Um, so we, we, we try to, you know, advocate on their behalf to whether it's the regional center or different, different entities to help them get what they need. Um, we also have some of our musicians, we were able to, well, we were able to purchase some, some instruments for them. So, you know, to build, build up their home studio or if they need a piano at home or if they need a guitar at home, we're able to provide that uh, for them. If they need like for our, our students who are teachers, they need like a whiteboard at home to teach their students online. And so we were able to provide those resources for our musicians as well. Um, so I kind of went in a, in a, in a tangent, but hopefully I, ans I answered your question. I oh. think that I think the issue of, of equity is an important one. Uh, and to um, can you talk a little bit more in terms of how you kind of um, what you're doing to kind of equalize um, opportunities in that space? I mean, are you you mentioned the fact that you're able to provide some support to find some equipment? Um, and are you finding that again, that, that that's an easy case to make or to, to get support for people who want to kind of make those type of investments or supports? Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's been a, a big point and a big focus of our grant efforts, or, you know, our grant application efforts is to, to kind of equalize that. Uh, because like, um, as, as, like I said, as a black woman, I'm very, very sensitive to equity issues because like, you know, we live in America. Um, and so I'm very, very sensitive to that, to that. So, you know, as, as a, as a black woman, as a young black woman, who's also an immigrant, um, living in America, I'm, and also leading an organization, uh, that primarily, uh, provides support to, you know, uh, individuals who may be heavily marginalized. I'm very, very, I'm, plugged into how different parts of their identity interact with each other and, and what equity issues or what what equity discrepancies may, 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 may arise. Um, and so, um, like I said, that's, that's why we've ha our grant efforts have been focusing a lot more on, you know, kind of, you know, equalizing or creating more equity in access for our students who may not have equal access, especially in this digital, in this digital, um, this digital age that we're living in. So there, there are a couple of uh, questions. Um, so uh, Laura's asked, are there other organizations that focus on other music genres? Oh, so great question. So I'm glad you asked that because that is a misnomer, but done on purpose because it's a, it's a conversation starter. So Jazz Hands does not focus just only on jazz. So we, like, as I mentioned earlier, we have musicians that rap, that sing gospel, that sing pop, that, you know, that sing ballads, that, you know, that, that play funk, soul, like it's, it really runs the gamut. Um, so Jazz Hands, we don't, we don't just focus on jazz. It, uh, the reason why we're called Jazz Hands is for two reasons. The first reason is that um, for some individuals with, with, uh, with autism, um, when they get, there's something called stimming. And you know, some, some for some reason, and this is not all, but for some pe people with autism, when they get excited, they they stim, and sometimes it looks like jazz hands. So it so it signifies excitement. And then number two, jazz hands is actually a a, a music theater um, kind of dance move, and it's usually done at the end of. Uh, of a show, so it signifies triumph. So jazz hands for autism is, signifies excitement and triumph over the stigma that is um, associated with autism. Uh, this is uh, another question from Lars and. Uh... Theory of mind, being able to understand the perspectives of others and realizing what may go into their thinking uh, is often a major problem for many people on the spectrum. Can the music experience be used to help individuals develop in this area? So I'm going to challenge that a little bit um, because I don't know if I fully agree with, the, with, with that theory, the, the theory of mind approach because in my experience and once again I'm not a clinician um so if uh please feel free, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong but in my experience um um our musicians actually like they I, there's really not much difference in the way that they are able to interact with other people you know um maybe they, they may not understand maybe every single social cue and, and maybe you know um and that, that may influence their ability to be able to socialize but um in regards to being able to perceive somebody else's emotions and things like that that occurs like that happens and it, and the music does amplify that if if I if I must say so so for example uh back to, to to the musician A that I mentioned who only like jazz um there's some songs that you, that you play that he feels very very strongly and that's part that, and that's part of his sensitivity to the song um he's like oh this makes me very sad you know um, and so, and it, you know, to, to maybe somebody else that may not be a, um, it may not be as, um, felt as strongly, but to him, he's very, very sensitive to the emotions, especially the emotions that, that are communicated through music. Uh, because one thing I think that should be mentioned, um, is that, and I, I know this just from personal experience, 
um, the way, the reason why music for me is the best way that I communicate is because there's so many different layers. It's such a dynamic force. Like I said, uh, you can communicate through lyrics. You can communicate through timbre, like the, just the texture of the music. You can communicate through tempo. You can communicate through like how the music rises, the crescendo and then, and then, and then the falling action. Like there are so many ways you can communicate emotion and um, a, a message through music without even saying anything. Um, and so music, it, it's, it, it, there's, it's, it just penetrates so many different layers. And then on top of that, the way that music music is, um, the music cognition is processed in the brain, it utilizes a lot of different structures in the brain. So um, it's, it, it engages a lot more processing within the brain than maybe just speech or something like that may not be able to um, um, engage. And so to answer your question, I do think that that music help that does assist with, you know, kind of building a bridge, you know, emotional bridge between a person who may have autism and a person who may not have autism or two people with autism or two people without autism. I think music is just a bridge in general that, that bridges emotions and thoughts and, um, and, and space between people. Thank you for that. Um, I really appreciate that, the, the nuances of, of, of your response. And so I want to, you mentioned earlier uh, a little bit about the, the music industry. Um, and I just kind of, I wanted to hear from you, um, are there things that the industry writ large could do that you feel would really kind of uh, advance uh, the hopes and dreams of some of the, the students that you see? Um, so great question. Um, so earlier you asked about collaboration, you know, within and outside of the organization. One of the biggest challenges that that we do face um, um, trying to build uh, bridges of connection between our musicians and the industry is that people don't necessarily fully understand autism, you know, and because of that, maybe some people may be afraid and, you know, that's not um, shade on them. It's just, you know, if what you, what you don't fully understand, you may be a little bit hesitant or apprehensive towards. Um, and so one thing that, um, one way that Jazz Hands is combating that um, is I uh, have this new show on YouTube. Uh, it's on our YouTube and our Instagram. It's called Three Minutes with Ifu. And I sit down with different uh, in people from the like industry giants, whether it's Fender or the Grammys and ask them, you know, like, you know, what, what are some things that, that you guys are doing to expand your definition of diversity and to include neurodiversity in, into that definition? Um, there are there are tr incredible musicians who have autism and, and because um, their autism, people may not understand their autism in, in the public, uh, maybe there may be barriers for them to be able to, to be able to show their ability and to be to share their ability to express their ability. And so I, I, I one way that I'm, that, that we're doing that at jazz is I'm sitting down with some, with some of these, you know, people from these industry giants to be able to have these conversations and see, you know, what do they need on their end to kind of fully understand um, and then um, what, how can jazz hands, you know, uh, provide support to our, with, to our musicians as they go out into the world. So one thing that we do do is uh, provide on the job um, coaching. So if our musician is going to go into um, a, a job or a position in the industry, they, if, they, if they require that, they, we would help, we would pair them with an uh, on the job coach that can help them navigate different um, nuances of being in that space. Um, and so that, that, that's one thing that we're doing. But I think policy wise, I think that uh, you know, kind of bringing it back always to policy. I think that, um, and I'm not sure what this looks like, but this can be something that, you know, some of the, the students at, you know, Price School of Public Policy look into, you know, is how can the music industry establish, how, establish policy that makes it actually more inclusive beyond just race and gender? Um, because I know that in the film industry, like there's like a quota, um, for lack of a, of a better word, um, that you know, a certain hires that are made must be women or must be people of, of you know a certain background. So why can't we have something like that for people with disabilities? You know, I think it's important to have that you know kind of have that policy in place so that people with disabilities have you know have access to be able to equalize the playing field. Um, so that's one idea that I have, um, but I'm not sure how exactly to navigate that. So I just do three minutes with Ifu and you know kind of what's in my, uh, <laughs> my wheelhouse. I love it. So I think we have time for maybe um, uh, one more question and then kind of any closing remarks that you might want to share. But uh, Matthew asks, you, or states, you mentioned the Zoom-based instruction or program reaching students in far-off cities beside uh, Southern California, but how about uh, rural areas and to include other states where this type of class or instruction wasn't available before the pandemic? So that's a great point, a great question. Um, and that's something that, you know, 
I, I, in all honesty, I, it had, I haven't fully considered. I've just been thinking about, you know, we've just been thinking about, you know, just different, different cities, exactly, you know, you know, in other places. But we haven't necessarily, you know, thought too much about the rural areas. And so that's something that we're definitely going to look into and see how we can expand. But I think that having our program available digitally would, would be will kind of overcome some of, the, some of that barrier to access that people in rural areas may face. You know, um, the internet generally is kind of widespread. So for, for people who are in rural areas that maybe have an internet connection, then maybe we can be able to support them. But if there's more support that they need, you know, beyond just, you know, just the, you know, the, the, the Zoom or the, the, the digital um, interaction, then, we, then we, we'll find a way, we'll explore ways, we'll research ways that we can, um, go about supporting uh, individuals in that in those areas as well so that's that's a great question something that definitely uh that i'm going to be that we're going to be th thinking about more as an organization so if people want to support you uh financially or in other means uh how should they contact <laughs> you or what what's the the website or kind of give us the um yes so it's what can you see it is www.jazzhandsforautism.org so um that's and you know if if you're if you're interested in, in volunteering, interning, donating, all that information, or or even uh, being a part, you know, you know, if you're a musician with autism, or you have a, a son or daughter who who has interest in music, um, that's also a way that, that you can contact us as well. Um, so please do feel free to vis visit our website. Uh, we're very responsive, um, so we'll definitely get back to you on that um, very quickly. Thank you. Thank you so much for those comments. And, and thank you so much for, for recognizing um, the value of people, right? Uh, the meeting people where they are uh, and to seeing people and not just uh, disabilities and to really uh, recognize that uh, you can have passion and you have support for your passion. Uh, you can do great things. Um, so anything else you'd like to, to share with our audience again, uh, um, just about your amazing organization? Yeah, I would just like to just leave um, the, all the listeners and the, and the viewers with just some final thoughts. Um, the first thing is kind of going back to the, the slogan for the disability rights movement is nothing without us, Not, nothing about us without us. Um, it's very, very important that every decision that's being made on behalf of people with disabilities includes people with disabilities. And one way that you can do that, once again, like I said, is through music by including their voices, their music, their songs, their expressions, you know, through music in that, in the, in those the, the decision-making spaces. And, you know, their music is actually a way. Listen to the music, hear what they're saying, hear what they're feeling um, and, you know, um, make room and be curious about their experience and their perception, their, their perception of the world. And then the, la the last thing I want to mention is just about policy, going back to that. There are so many different ways that policy has moved us forward and so many different ways that it's, it's holding us back, especially for uh, people with, with, with disabilities. So, you know, music education should be a mandatory for all for all people especially people with disabilities. And then, you know, policy that requires different industries to make sure that they, that, that they're hire when they're hiring, they're hiring people who are not just like, who are not just maybe physically uh, disabled, but also who, who fall under the spectrum of neurodiversity as well. So also always including neurodiversity in any discussion about, you know, any kind of civic, you know, civic rights or civil rights uh, movements or discussions, I think is very, very important. And also in any, in all po policy making spaces, always think about the neurodiverse uh, community as well. Thank you so much, Ifu, for those for those comments. Uh, thank you for the reminder uh, that we need to make room for different voices. Yes, we need to be uh, curious about uh, what's going on around us, the people around us, and we need to recognize that policy matters. Policy right? matters. It, it it changes the rules of the game for everyone. Yes. Thank you to all of those who've taken the time to join us for uh, this session. Uh, we appreciate it, and we appreciate your voice, Ifu. And so, again, we Thank you celebrate so much. Jazz Hands for Autism. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have a blessed day. You Bye -bye too. Bye, everybody.